Good morning. morning. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 2, verses 1 through 6. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers into the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah? Was, where was the Messiah was to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is where the prophet has written. This is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Dear God, thank you for this great day where we can gather to your, in your house to worship. And thank you for sending your son to die for our sins so that we may accept your promise of eternal life. Now be with Pastor Ed as he brings us your message. In your name we pray, amen. Oh, come on, guys, don't be that shy. I won't bite, I promise. How we doing, everybody? Good. Okay, now, I've got a couple of books up here with me. I've got that one there. You guys see that one? It's pretty standard, black, kind of shiny. Is this a nice-looking Bible? It's nice? Does it look pretty good? And then I've got this one, kind of a nice red color, isn't it? Is this, is this, this is another Bible. Uh, it doesn't say that on the front, it's just got the red, but um, it's kind of kind of older, it's got writing in it, stuff like that. It's still a nice one, right? No? It's kind of nice. Okay, handle this one. There's another one. This is another Bible, so it's got a cross in the front of it. It's kind of coming apart. Held together by duct tape and athletic tape a little. There it goes. Now, this is a nice-looking Bible too, right? Right? No? Well, okay, I'm going to put these ones out here. Which one of you thinks, or which one of these books do you think has been read more than the other ones? Which one's been read the most? Or maybe, which one's been read the least? This one? Why? It's the nicest-looking one, right? Why do you think this one has been read more than this one? What makes you think that? Good. This looks like somebody just bought it, and this looks like what? Somebody's read it for a long time, or somebody wasn't real careful with taking care of his confirmation Bible real well. <laughs> Do you see a recurring theme, the athletic tape? What do you want your Bible to look like when you're older? What do you want it to look like? Who, wants, who thinks they want their Bible to look like this? Want it to look like that? Who wants their Bible to look like this? Hmm. I hope your Bible looks something like this when you guys get older. Does that sound terrible? I hope your Bible looks terrible when it gets older. Do you know why? I went to college. And you got to read a lot. You got to read a lot of books in college. And there were a couple of times, not on purpose, but I fell asleep while I was studying and tried to learn my book by osmosis. That means you stick your head on it and you hope the information just like a sponge soaks into your brain. You know how that worked? How do you think I did on the test when I slept on my book? You fail. <laughs> Epic failure because your brain will not get the information in a book if you sleep on it or if it sits on a shelf. You know the reason why I hope your Bible looks like this when you get older? Mens, you read your Bible. It means you 
used it enough that the binding got busted and you had to tape it together to hold it together. I hope when you open it, you've got passages that got like writing and highlighting all over it. I hope you go in there and there's notes and there's underlining and all that stuff. I hope you've got to replace your Bible after 10 years and you almost cry when you have to replace it because that Bible has become a part of you and you know it that well. There's a verse in Psalm 119 that says this, says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's talking about God's word, the Bible. And the person who wrote that psalm is saying, Your word is like, it, it, without it, I wouldn't be able to see. I've got to open your word. I've got to read your word. I want to know your word more. I want to study it more. I never want to stop studying your word. My prayer for, for, for all of us I've got another book that I was going to bring out here, too, that's founded on the lowest level of my, of my bookshelf in my office, and it's all covered with dust. I think that means I've got to clean in my office. But that book was all covered with dust. I, I'm pretty sure some of us have a Bible in our house that's covered with dust. And if a book's covered with dust, how long has it been sitting there? Good long time. If God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, and we haven't opened it for a while, it is pretty dark, right? So my prayer for you guys, for all of us, is that we treasure God's word, we use it all the time, and we read it and write all over our Bibles and know them. Okay, let's pray, guys. I gotta thank you. I thank you that you gave us your word. I thank you that you speak to us in your word. I thank you that through your Holy Spirit that you create faith that you sustain faith, that you strengthen faith. Uh, God, I pray for, um, for all of us uh, that we would value your word, that we would treasure your word, that we would seek to, to hear from you daily. Uh, Lord, I pray that um, our Bibles get messed up. I pray that they get held together by duct tape and sewing needles and whatever else we can hold them together with. I pray that we write in them and, and, and create memories uh, of when we learned things, when, when you taught us things. Uh, God, I pray that we would recognize that your word is living and active, uh, that it never fails to do what you intend for it to do. And so, Lord, I pray you bless us as we learn from you through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, yeah. So that's yeah. what you do for my books. It was like they're covered with chopped off and then you paint it. Get out of here. Nice. <laughs> Approaching your throne boldly, not because we are good, but because you are good and have invited us into your throne room. Uh, God, so we come before you with, with all of our hurts, with all of our needs, with all of our brokenness uh, to hear of your amazing love again. Uh, God, we as a church, we hold up our friends and family, uh, those we love, um, those who are around us and hurting. Uh, God, we pray for those who mourn. We pray for the family of Gary Harder, the family of, of, of Caitlin Hank. Uh, God, we pray for uh, those who are healing from surgeries, from sickness, from hurt, um, uh, and, and from some that we know and some that, that people keep very private to themselves. Lord, we, we raise up all, all those around us. Uh, God, we pray specifically this morning for Carol High in El Salvador, where she has uh, gone many years now to, to, to teach at the orphanage there. Lord, we pray that you would bless her, that you would be near her, that you would supply her, ner her needs, uh, that you would keep her safe. Uh, God, as in these next few months as she is serving you there, Lord, we pray that you would bless her um, and the children that she ministers to and the families as well. Uh, God, I thank you uh, for her willingness to go and serve and bring your name um, to those families. Uh, and God, now this morning, I pray that... Uh, you would come as you've promised. Where two or three are gathered, you are there. Uh, God, speak to us in your word. Teach us from your Holy Spirit. Reveal to us the, the entire purpose of all of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. If you've got your Bibles, open up to Genesis 49. And we are rapidly coming to the end of, I think this is probably the longest series I've ever done here now in six years. And... Uh, We've kind of hit the climax of things last week when, when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. He's been, he is the ruler of Egypt. The only person above him is the Pharaoh. They've been starving. He feeds them. The son, that, the brother that they, they had sold to slavery had all the power in the world over his brothers and didn't exercise that power to destroy them. They're all still shocked and amazed at this. 
it seems like this is the, the, the crescendo. Everything in Genesis is really built to this big moment. Now we've got these next couple of chapters, and things start to, like any good story, things start to get kind of wrapped up at the end. You know, things get the neat little bow at the end of it, and it's, everything gets resolved. That's the way we normally think of things, and to some extent, that's the way Genesis works. At the end of Genesis, we're going to see everything set up for really the rest of Scripture, the rest of the Bible. If you miss Genesis, if you don't get what Genesis is about, the rest of the Bible will be a mystery to you, or you will misinterpret, you will misuse over and over and over again. If we say that the key hermeneutic, the, the, the key way to understand the entire Bible is, can be summed up in one word, and it's one person, Jesus Christ. Okay, that's two words, sorry. Jesus. If you miss Jesus, you miss it all. If you come through Genesis and learn Genesis the way I learned most of the Old Testament, the way I kind of learned Genesis as a kid, it was disjointed stories that taught me a moral. It was disjointed stories that seemed to kind of teach me, don't be like this person, be like this person. Don't do that, do this. If you do this, you will be blessed. If you do this, you will be cursed. And we kind of look at Genesis, we look at the whole Bible when we understand it that way as this how-to book. It teaches me what to do so that things will go well for me. And if things aren't going well for me, I go back to the Bible as this kind of, all right, where have I gone wrong? So now I can fix that so then God will start opening up the blessings again for me and things will get right. Do you notice there's no Jesus Christ in that understanding of Scripture? There's no room for a Jesus. There's no need for a Savior. What you believe you need is right instructions. What I need to do is clean up my act. What I need to do is become a better person. And the Bible can be used that way to teach you how to be a, quote, better person. And if you do, the Bible will be filled completely with contradictions. The Bible will be confusing to you. And you will write off whole sections of Scripture to fit what you think you really need. We said all along through Genesis, we've looked at what God has been doing, not at what the people have been doing. We've been hearing this over and over again. The people do what we expect them to do. They sin. They make bad decisions. They hurt each other. This we're familiar with. We know this. We experience it every single day. The one who acts in, in contrary ways, the one who does things that we don't expect is God. Over and over and over again, God intervenes. He doesn't intervene to just bring judgment. He intervenes with grace. He intervenes with hope. From the very start of Genesis, the, when people enter into sin for the first time, Adam and Eve eat of the fruit, discover they're naked, go and hide behind a little bush from God, and God walks out, and in grace and mercy, God says, where are you? That's, that's the first word of grace in the entire Bible. Where are you? We think about that. We've all been the little kid or played hide and seek with, or peekaboo with a little kid, right? You ever seen the toddler hide behind like a cup? If I close my eyes, you can't see me, right? We've seen it. And who's played along? I hope you have. I hope you're not the, oh, I totally see where you're at. I hope you're not that parent. Come on. You've got to play along a little bit. God didn't ask Adam and Eve where they were because he didn't see them. God had promised, if you eat from that fruit, you will surely die. If God wanted to, he could have simply brought judgment right then, right there. He could have destroyed everything right there, right then. What does God say? Where are you? He calls him out. And in Genesis 3.15, God makes the promise that sets off the rest of Scripture. Everything else in Scripture is the unfolding of this plan that God says to Eve, I'm going to send a seed, a child. One is going to come through you, Eve. He's going to be an enemy. Enmity is the word we always see. That idea of enemy, that conflict between your seed and the serpent's seed. Sin, death, destruction will be in utter conflict continuously with the seed that Eve will produce. 
that seed will crush the head of the serpent. And the rest of Scripture starts to unpack what that really means. A seed, a child, means there's one who's going to come. In the rest of Genesis, we start seeing this unfolding a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Abraham, in Genesis 12, is given a promise. God calls this pagan man out from his family, leave your country, come to the land I'm going to show you. Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you'll bless all the people of the earth. I'm going to make you wealthy. I'm going to make you into a huge na- into multiple nations. This is an old man who has no children and waits decades before he actually has this child. God says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you even though you don't deserve it. I'm going to protect you even though you don't deserve it. And Abraham, you'd think, if God makes a promise like that to you, anybody like that idea? Anybody who curses you, I'll curse. Anybody who blesses you, I'll bless. Does that sound like a good deal? I'm going to make you wealthy? Sound like a good deal? I'm going to protect you? I'm going to watch over you? I mean, this is like awesome. Would you trust God more if you heard his voice and he made a promise like that to you? Do you think you'd trust him? Abraham, over and over and over again, doesn't quite believe it. He goes into a new territory. He fears that his beautiful wife is going to have him killed so that the king of that territory will kill Abraham and take his wife. So he repeatedly, not once, twice, he goes into a new kingdom and essentially passes his wife off as his sister so that he won't be in danger. Is Abraham a hero of faith? Or is his faith just like yours and mine? Abraham is a hero of faith. And his faith is just like yours and mine. And God never once says, Abraham, you've doubted me, so I'm going to take it all back. God binds himself to this imperfect man, Abraham, not because Abraham was so good, but because God is the one who is good. And if God made his promise conditional on anybody, if it was conditioned on how faithful anyone was to his promise, if it was conditioned on the actions of a person, a human being like you and me, his plan would never work. So God bound his promise to an imperfect man and said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to bless the whole world. It will happen. All throughout this whole book, it's building to this point Jacob is an old man now, and he has received back his, his favored son, Joseph. They're all together again, and he's basically recognizing that he's going to die soon. And before it gets too late, he's going to bless his sons. He would have all of them come into him, and one by one, he would put his hand on their head, and he'd bless them. Genesis 49 records this blessing, and we're just going to focus on one of them, but Uh, I'll read just a couple of them real quickly to you because they're not quite what you would think of as a blessing. Okay, if uh, you're going to have a blessing from somebody, do you expect them to uh, talk about your good qualities and their hopes for you? Or do you think they're going to mention all of your bad qualities and maybe some judgment that's going to happen to you? Okay, how would you like to hear this? Reuben, you're my firstborn. Okay, starts out pretty nice. My might and the first fruits of my strength preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Wow, sounds pretty neat. Unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence. Okay, unstable as water. Anybody want to hear that about you? This is the start, and it doesn't change. Simeon, Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul not come into your counsel. In other words, I don't want to take any advice from you two. Okay, let's move on. Uh, cursed by, be their anger, for it is fierce. We're going to skip Judah for right now. Zebulun shall dwell on the shore of the sea and shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall be in Sidon. Okay, that was pretty neutral. Okay, he's going to have a place to go. Issachar is a strong donkey. Do you want that to be your blessing? Dan shall judge people. Raiders shall raid Gad. Nephtali is a doe let loose. Joseph is a fruitful bow. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. There's a predictive part and there's a blessing part to all that, that, that Jacob says to his sons. From what you guys know of these sons, who deserves the biggest blessing? Who deserves the biggest blessing? 
Okay, who deserves to have the most money? Ooh, that's touchy. Who deserves to get paid the most? Okay, but in our world, okay, for, for us, who deserves to make the most money? The person who works the hardest and provides the most valuable service, right? I mean, that just kind of makes sense. Who deserves to be famous? Who deserves to be famous? The person who does something really, really well that most of us are, wow, that's, that's amazing. You hear a performance, you hear somebody play an instrument, do it really well, you just go, Wow. And you've got to like forward it on Facebook so everybody else sees it. Right? Who deserves, about all these sons, to receive the biggest part of the blessing? Should it be? Who among these sons has done anything worthy of being praised? Joseph. Okay? His other brothers... Not Benjamin, he was too young. The other 10 brothers sold him into slavery. Genesis doesn't stop there. It keeps recording what these brothers do. When their sister Dinah is raped, all the brothers, Joseph included, is part of this group that goes to Dan and basically kills all the men. Gideon takes his father's concubines. That's why he's kicked out of the blessing. Judah does... if. It, Stupid, stupid things over and over again. And Genesis shows them all. Genesis doesn't shy away from revealing these guys were sinners just like everybody else. They're not saints the way we would call them. Joseph does not receive the biggest part of the blessing. He does get a double portion. So in other words, he gets this, this, this picture of preeminence. And instead of becoming one tribe of Israel... His two sons will each become a tribe of Israel. So in that, in the, the earthly part of the blessing, he does receive a birthright. His father gives him double inheritance compared to all his other brothers. But he does not receive the promise. See, Genesis traces this seed from Genesis 3.15, Genesis 12, from father to son, it traces this. Who's going to receive the blessing? Oftentimes, it's the younger brother, not the older brother. Jacob and Esau, Isaac, these, it is the least of these that receives it. And here we see in the blessing that Judah gives, this one son by the name of Judah, who has a whole chapter dedicated to his stupidity earlier in Genesis. I think it's Genesis 39. You can read it if you want to on your own. Dedicated to his stupidity. Judah receives this blessing. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, and he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The, pic, the, the word picture they're painting is like, you all see the nature channel of a, a lion or whatever guarding its, its prey. It's got like a dead zebra there, and it's protecting it from everybody else. That's the word picture here. Judah, you're like a lion who dares go near you. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, or until the one to whom tribute is due arrives. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey colt, donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garment in wine and his vesture is the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Judah gets this incredible blessing. Your brothers will bow down to you. The scepter, okay, what do you think of when you hear scepter? Who holds the scepter? A king. The scepter is not going to depart from you, Judah, until the one who deserves tribute arrives. And then to him the obedience of the nations will be given. This is like the high point of Genesis. This, is, this sets up everything else in Scripture. Everything else is going to be revealed. That's why we read from uh, Matthew chapter 2. When Jesus is born and Herod wants to know where he's going to be born, they quote Micah 2 verse 5. You, O Bethlehem, although you're the least, 
in all of Judah. He brings out this amazing promise from Judah, from this tribe. Okay, we've gone from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Now we know Judah carries this promise. The rest of the Old Testament starts to unveil. Where does this promise go from here? Where does it go? Exodus starts out, and all of a sudden, we've dealt with one family. All through Genesis, it's really dealing with this one family line of Abraham all the way to Judah. When we start in Exodus, Exodus is all of a sudden now, Israel is a nation. And somewhere within this nation is this promised family. If you want to protect someone, one individual, what's the best way to do it? Talk about lions and nature shows. Okay, if you've got, who, okay, those of you guys who watch the Discovery Channel, when the wildebeest are going to cross the river, you set your DVR to record because you've got to watch the crocodiles, right? The crocodiles all line up and they're just waiting. And there's usually, they get to the edge and they all start massing up. And if one wildebeest jumps in the water, what happens to him? It's awesome. You've got to watch it in slow motion. It's boom! Croc comes flying out of nowhere, takes him right out. And all the other wildebeests go, ooh. Then another one, I've got to get to the other side. He jumps in by himself. What happens to him? Boom! Right again. What's the best way for one individual to be safe? All the wildebeests, like six billion of them at once, just go, just go trouncing across the water. God chooses to provide protection for his seed, his promised family, in a nation. Israel is that nation. They go, up to e they go up to Egypt for protection. God provides for them. They would starve to death and die if it weren't for God's provision. God brings them to Egypt and protects his promised family in a nation. We don't hear about this, prop, this, this individual family which is being watched, which is being protected, which is being, genealogy is, is watching this until we get to the book of Ruth. And Ruth traces this promise from Judah to his son, Perez, to another son, and eventually to a guy named David. The New Testament starts out with a genealogy. You ever get wrapped up in the genealogies? Going, why would you waste so much space in such an important book with all these genealogies. They're there to show this specific line, pointing all the way to Jesus. I'm going to read this to close. This is from Tim Keller, and I hope this hasn't sounded too much like a history lesson, but I, because this is the key to understanding everything else in Scripture. If you don't see Jesus in the passage you're reading, Ask yourself, what am I missing? Dig deeper, read farther around it, talk to someone because you're missing the point if you don't see Jesus in it. And this I'm stealing boldly from Tim Keller. I don't feel so bad because he stole it from his mentor, Ed Clowney. This is called Jesus is the True and Better. And I, this, I hope, starts to tie all of Genesis and all of the Old Testament together in pointing. Jesus is the true and better. He's the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is imputed or given to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that now that cries out not for our condemnation but our acquittal. Jesus is the true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void not knowing where, where he went to create a new people of God. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us. And when God said to Abraham, now I know that you love me because you do not, did not withhold your son, your only son whom you love from me, now we can look at God taking his son up to the mountain and sacrifice him and say, now we know that you love us because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you loved from us. Jesus is the true and better Jacob who wrestled and took the blow of justice that we deserve, so that we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace to wake, up, to wake us up and to discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph, who at the right hand of the king forever for, forgives those who betrayed and sold him and used his power to save them. Jesus is the true and better Moses, who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord, and who mediates a new covenant. 
Jesus is the true and better rock of Moses, who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. Jesus is the true and better Job, who truly, innocent, who truly is innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for us and saves his stupid friends. Jesus is the true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish them himself. Jesus is the true and better Esther, who did, didn't just risk everything on earthly palace, but lost the ultimate and heavenly one, who didn't just risk a life, but gave his life for his people. Jesus is the true and better Jonah, who was cast out of the storm so that we could be brought in. Jesus is the real rock of Moses, the real Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain, so the angel of death will pass over us. He's the true temple, the true prophet, the true peace, priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, the true bread. The Bible's really not about you, it's about him. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that for this book of Genesis, for the ways that you show yourself, reveal yourself to be a God of grace, that you created that there would be grace, that you planned your son from the beginning. Uh, God, what we do, our sin matters. Our sin is real. Our sin creates separation. Our sin creates damage. It hurts, and we break ourselves with it. God, forgive us for trying to fix it ourselves because it is a hopeless task. And God, help us to see your provision, your work for us in your word. Help us to see your son crucified for us in our place. And God, help us to see him risen in our place. Uh, Lord, bless us as we, as we read our Bibles, as we study, as we uh, do devotions, as we try to learn more about you, to know you more. Uh, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come to us, that you would teach us, that you would put people in our, in our lives, in our presence, who can teach us from your word, to know it more. Uh, God, help us to value it. Help us to understand it when it seems confusing, when it seems puzzling, when it sounds like you're telling us we need to clean up our act in order for you to love us. God, help us to recognize that that is the law, and the law has a purpose, and it is to break us. And when we are broken, God... We pray for the gospel because the gospel brings healing where it is broken. It brings resurrection where there is death. God, meet us in our death with your hope. In Jesus' name, amen. As the ushers get ready to receive our, our gifts and offerings this morning, um, if you're coming on Wednesday night, please just use the tear out. Let us know that you're going to.